you have heard me speak before. Aw, and you came back. Aw, <laughs> thank you. Um, I have the rare pleasure. Uh, this has never happened ever before in my life, and I'm decently old. Um, I have never spoken with my nephew on stage before. This is our first time, and I used to change his diapers, <laughs> you know? While I'm doing this, uh, uh, guys, uh, my computer is uh, not doing its thing again, and I really need that if I could have it. I don't know why it keeps leaving, because there are notes on there of things I could be saying to people, and you know, the jokes I made up and stuff like that. I wanted to let you know, well, first of all, I've known this boy since he came out of the birth canal. And yes, he did the usual boy thing. When you would change his diaper, he would pee on you. I couldn't resist. He is so renowned in his field, I couldn't resist saying that on stage. He's going to kill me. I wanted to let you know that I'm trying to push my buttons here and nothing's happening. Um, help me. Okay, I wanted to let you know that um, there's actually quite good research, you've probably heard me say this before, that concurrent taking notes while learning something new or complicated de-enhances learning. I'm having to travel to middle and high schools all over the country to say that. The reason I bring that up with you right now is I'm going to give you a, access to a PDF of everything we cover. Not only, yes, not only so that you don't have to take notes, um, but also um, so that, um, and Terry has the pointer in his pocket, I'll just kind of wander over and hope it appears in my hand. <laughs> Thank you. Um, not only uh, can you get this, you have to go on this website, put it, click on that word, click on that word, and put in this code and make sure there's not a capital E, okay? If you forget, just Google me, send me an email, and, and I'll send it to you. This is important because I've been a teacher forever before becoming a psychologist. And I think instinctively we have known many of the things that we're gonna say to you today and we try to convince parents of them. But now we actually have brain science. We watch brains work and we have the science behind what we believe in. So I'm gonna say to you, more than almost any other factor, <clears throat> a caregiver's connection and bond with a child has more to do with learning than most other things. You knew that, right? In other words, that's your first job. That's what I, I'm gonna say to you over and over. The nice part about Terry, he's a neuroscientist. He's going to prove it to you in the brain. And his slides have all of these nice big words. And they talk about which parts of the brain do what. So it's critical that you have this ammunition so that when you're making the case to parents, you have the data. So his job is the science part. Don't let all the terminology throw you. It's critically important to understand what goes on in the brain. And then afterwards, I stand up and say simple things. <laughs> so if you have a question that relates to what is presently being said, neither of us are being clear and you need to know, wave your hand wildly and we'll call on you because it's bad teaching to just keep going and wait until the very end for questions. But we'll also give time at the end for any questions that you have, okay? Is everybody okay with that? And now I get to sit down and relax and enjoy this man that I love. Thank you, Antoine, for that kind invitation, uh, uh, introduction, and I'll just say that if I happened to pee on you when I was a baby, I'm sure you deserved it. <laughs> so. I wasn't real good at diapers. <laughs> okay, well, this is my pleasure to be here, and I am very excited to do this, uh, you know, 
if, if this is successful, perhaps we'll even do it again. Uh, you know, who knows what the future may hold. Uh, I, I'm here really to, in, all in, in all seriousness to try and invite you into what I consider to be a revolution. Uh, we have before us in, in society today and in early child education as well as in higher education. I work at a university and I get the students that you have th so thoughtfully prepared for, uh, for college and university life. Uh, where we have the capacity to use brain science to shape our educational practices, to optimize them for learning. And so what I want to do today is, you know, stretch your borders perhaps a little bit and what you know about the brain and why, it's, why we think it's important uh, for the educational process. So <clears throat> when it comes to the brain, there are some basic principles that you probably already know. And what's really cool about neuroscience these days is that uh, you know, we have this brain mapping initiative that came out from the president. And, and the reason why I describe this as a revolution in, uh, in education these days is that, is that you know, students these days are really excited about what's happening in the brain. And uh, you know, the, it turns out that the brain is extremely dynamic. It's constantly changing and we can optimize uh, the brain for optimal learning through a variety of different practices. And uh, it turns out that when it, comes to, you know, when it comes to preparing yourself for learning or for preparing children for learning, that, uh, that how you perceive your brain or yourself can really shape the way your, your willing, willingness to accept new information. Now, here's, here's a good example. I've got a, an eight-year-old who's learning to play guitar and he's struggling with his finger, pink, pinky finger stretch to the fourth fret. And he says, Dad, I can't do it. I have to use my third finger and move my hand. And the, he's fighting with the guitar teacher against it. And, and he says, I just can't do it. And that mindset that he can't do it is what's preventing him from doing that, OK? So it turns out that the willingness, the understanding that you know, when we explain to him, OK, listen, this is about teaching your pinky to stretch. Your brain controls that, and you are your brain. So getting his mindset to shift really helped him, and now he's a fourth finger fret kid, you know, just like he should be. And so mindset is really critical to, uh, to, to shaping children's willingness to, uh, to learn. And so, you know, we have some examples of some books that uh, Joanne has put together, and Joanne and I uh, worked on this one here, which targets different kids of different age, and what we find is that uh, these books are useful not just for kids, but also for the parents and the educators who are working with those kids. And the idea here is that we can s supply you with some perspective from brain function uh, on the basic aspects of brain function that will help, that will help you uh, to, uh, to teach children. So we lost the computer here. Did we? We keep losing the connection here. We can, can you all, you see it, right? Okay, okay, hmm. thank you, okay. Okay, so what do we know about brain structures that are critical to learning? This is, you know, in some ways you could, you could ask yourself as an educator, why do I care how the brain controls learning? What, all we really care is that the brain is, possi is possible to learn. Right? And, that, and we don't need to know much about it. But the reality is that if you have some understanding of how the brain operates and how it functions, you can, you can work with it better. We have a couple of key, key structures that maybe you've heard a little bit about. Uh, the hippocampus, in particular, is one that is a, is a very large brain structure that's part of the limbic system, which is involved with many aspects of learning and memory. And what's really neat about this is that it helps to encode and store information. This is de these are things like declarative memories. These are the factual pieces of information that you supply to the children. All of that gets concatenated and, and uh, locked down into the hippocampus and stored for later use. It also, the hippocampus also plays a really important role in navigating uh, through the world. So we say that this structure helps to create mental maps of, uh, of the environment. You can see from this picture here that it is relatively deep in the brain, and it receives extensive input from many other structures in the brain. Another critical structure from an educational standpoint is the cerebral cortex. And this is a really interesting place, and you probably know a little bit about the cortex, because this is where a lot of your complex thinking happens. 
And what's interesting is how dynamic and ever-changing the cortex in particular is across early development. And so the, the fully mature cortex is responsible for things like effective decision-making, planning and forethought, abstract thinking and lo logical operations, and, uh, and integration of complex information. And what's so cool about the way that the brain develops, and the cortex in particular, for me, is that it, it, it seems to come online in a very directional way. It starts really to develop from the hind regions of the cortex more towards the front, which means that as you get to the frontal cortex, right, the first thing to develop, the more mature skills, begin with motor coordination, then they move into language, they move, in, they move into integration of sensory and motor information, and then ultimately they move into the frontal regions which are involved in co complex decision making. So really neat to think, I th in my mind, that, uh, that the brain development, the cortical development, which is responsible for many forms of uh, of uh, planning and in integration of information uh, uh, develops in a linear way. So there are ages, I guess by inference, at which kids are not biologically prepared to do certain types of tasks. We've known this for a long time. This is why we don't teach algebra to first graders, right? Because they are not capable of the abstract logical operations that algebra entail. So this has been really well represented in the brain literature, and so one of the key points that I would like you to sort of keep in mind is that these really large structures of the brain are what we consider to be higher cognitive or thinking structures in the brain that are critical to information processing. That's storage, encoding, retrieval, as well as the manipulation of that information uh, and connecting of dots. So here's another example of brain literature that, uh, uh, brain science, that, uh, that kind of changes the way we think about the brain. It turns out that the, early, the newborn brain has billions and billions of neurons in the cortex, okay, what we call gray matter. And what happens over time is that those, those neurons in the cortex go from being all over the place, lots and lots of them, to actually reducing across early development. Because what happens is you have this sky full of stars, if you will. Each of those stars represents, you know, a neuron, and over time, the become what you would consider to be connected constellations of neurons, where the, even though there are few of them, fewer of them, they are better connected and better wired to optimize thinking and planning. Does that make sense? So what, the way that that shows up when you look at the brain imaging studies is with extensive gray matter at birth, and by the age of 20, you have significantly less number of neurons in your cortex. That seems a little bit counterintuitive when you think about skill development, right? but it's really about the connectivity within the cortex. So we have to do, well, our job as educators is to get those neurons to wire up and fire properly and synchronize their activity so that we get constellations of neatly organized activity rather than a scattered and disparate, disjointed uh, neural activity. I hope that that uh, makes, makes good sense. Um, so it really, it's about designing tasks and procedures that are, are critical. The other thing that's really interesting, and this was a, you know, sort of a mini revolution in neuroscience about 20 years ago, when we discovered you know, there was this old belief system that you are born with all of the neurons that you'll ever have. And the fa that nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, there are new, new neurons being born in your brain at all times of the day, every day. Now, this, is, this process is what we call neurogenesis. And, there are, and it happens in relatively discrete parts of the brain, and it's most prevalent in the brain structures where learning occurs, like the hippocampus, which I think is really, really neat. So this neurogenesis, though, this steady production of a few thousand neurons every day, is not something that is totally stagnant. It's not like the flowing Nile, right? It, it is one of these things where the fate and rate of those cells being produced can be changed by many different circumstances. So what are the circumstances that can modify neurogenesis? Here's an example. Enriched versus impoverished environments. Now, what I'm showing you here is, uh, is a, an example from rodent models. And what I think is really neat about this is how much we can learn from what we call preclinical models. 
uh, these concepts of neurogenesis and learning, these things are all represented in everything as low as mice and rats to non-human primates uh, and also in humans. And so if you have an impoverished environment, one where there's not much to do other than eat and drink and maybe interact with a partner, relative to, you know, uh, 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 rodents that live in, in sort of the jungle gym uh, of life. What happens is that the impoverished environment leads to deprivation effects and reduces neurogenesis. It also leads to fewer connections among other neurons. So if you look at this trace of a neuron here, this is the cell body, and these are essentially the axons or the wires that come off and connect that neuron up with other neurons. What happens is that in an enriched environment, you get much more branching, which is indicative of more connectivity of that neuron because it's been used. So this is the brain science that supports why we have and why we work so hard to foster enriched environments in, uh, in our classrooms, okay? So what are some other things that modulate neurogenesis? Remember, we're talking about, uh, about creating new neurons and getting those you know, inserted into the fabric of your brain so that they can work. Obesity versus exercise, right? So these are the two poles uh, uh, of things that can, can uh, affect neurogenesis. Uh, people who are obese, there are things that are produced by fat cells that can help, uh, that kind of squelch neurogenesis. They don't shut it off altogether, but they reduce the rate of neurogenesis. Relative to regular moderate exercise, this is just about maybe uh, you know, walking a mile or two, a couple miles a day, but regular moderate exercise has shown to improve the rate of neurogenesis and the cell fate, uh, the fate of those neurons that are being born. So this is why we, you, know, we, uh, uh, we, you see so much emphasis on the relationship between regular moderate exercise and, uh, and, uh, and learning and why recess and getting out there and being active is, remains a critical component, component of early childhood education, despite the politicians or whoever else might want to pull those things out so that you can have more time for, uh, 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 for classroom instruction. Another example of a major factor which will impact the rate of new neuron formation uh, is the stress, right? So, Stress is uh, the relative state of well-being versus distress can severely impact the rate of neurogenesis. We've known for many years that stress suppresses neurogenesis and therefore impacts, and is probably one of the mechanisms by which you get impaired learning and memory under stressful circumstances. Now you have to think about this um, from a long-term standpoint. If your brain is giving birth to a few thousand new neurons every day, and you go through a period of pro prolonged chronic stress exposure and during which the rate of neurogenesis is reduced, what is the long-term impact of that going to be on your learning capacity later in life? Well, this probably explains some of the relationships that we see between children that are reared in highly stressful environments and some learning impairments and ch achievement gaps um, that exist in those kids. So just a few examples of things that can significantly impact um, uh, uh, the cognitive function. Okay, so what about social relationships? And really, this is sort of the point, this is the pivot point where we're gonna really talk about what I think is, uh, is most relevant. When you may recall from that previous slide, one of the key features of the impoverished environment, which was uh, interesting there, was that there were two rats in that cage. And rats that are allowed to interact socially really develop actually pretty well, despite the fact that they don't have the jungle gym. So it turns out that social relationships, even in rodent populations, are absolutely essential to normal brain development. In fact, if you were to do something strange, like rear a rat, you know, raise a rat in a, in a, a relative, um, relatively isolated environment with very little social interaction, they would develop very abnormally, very abnormally. So social processes in mammals come in many variations and transform and change across early development. So the key here, of course, is that we're not rats. We're people. And our kids, I mean, although we occasionally call our children, you dirty rat, <laughs> you know, <laughs> only in a loving way, <laughs> right? <laughs> so what does this mean for humans? Well, there, in, in thinking about social interaction and social processes generally, there is a really rich array of social processes that occur in, uh, in humans. And so it's far more complicated than just, uh, than just, just mates. These, uh, 
Social relationships also transform and change in very dynamic ways across the lifespan, okay? And this is part of what we study in the laboratory, is uh, the transformation of social relationships across the lifespan and the importance of social behavior, positive social interactions, for various features of development, okay? So in infancy, we can look at the parent-child interactions as, a, as a, a, an essential component of normal uh, brain development, and uh, that parent-child interactions uh, help, the, and the social bond between parent and, and offspring is critical, a critical determinant of the depth of relationships can, that, are, that, are, that the individual win, will engage in later in life, okay? Sorry. We, uh... Later on, a little while later, during early childhood, this, uh, the, you know, these social relationships become a little bit less dependent on the parents, we hope, and peer-to-peer uh, and and -peer interactions play a much larger role. What you see here is a couple of kids who are engaging in ruffle and tumble play, and I've, I remember at a very formative time in my life seeing videos of, uh, of two rats that these are juvenile rats that were probably uh, age, the age equivalent of six to eight year olds. And these two rats were put together in a cage and allowed to interact. And they are romping around and doing rough and tumble play and they're pinning each other and nipping each other on the neck and they're just having a blast. And what's really interesting is that rats will seek out an environment where they can play more. So this is something that is really richly rewarding to them. And then right afterwards, I saw a video of two kids that were about six, you know, six or seven years old who were doing exactly the same thing. It was really amazing at how the nature of the play behavior was so highly conserved in humans relative to these other much lower species. So the evolution of this process uh, and the, we, what we know now is the brain structures that control this peer-to-peer -peer interaction are really hardwired in the brain in the, in the deep fundamental recesses of the brain. I can't stand it. Can I say something? Absolutely. I work with preschools all of the time. And a lot of preschool teachers don't allow rough and tumble play. And I think we do that because we're afraid of parents who are going to tell us that you know their kids get hurt or that kind of thing. Part of what Terry is saying, what the brain research is saying, is this kind of social interaction, even the rough and tumble play, is critical for the development of neurons. Not nice if it happens, but critical for the development. So undergirding everything he's saying, hear that part, all of these things he's talking about, we must make sure happen in the environment of these kids, regardless of our particular value or feeling for it. I just couldn't resist. Onward. I'll, I'll sit here like this. Oh, it's totally fine. Interrupt any time. And I will say, just anecdotally, as the father of three boys, uh, which is a little bit crazy, uh, you know, uh, that, that nothing makes my children happier than when I lay on the floor and, and, and allow them to just jump all over me and we do rough and tumble play. Sometimes it gets a little rougher, sometimes there's a little more tumbling. Uh, sometimes there's some crying, you know, when things get a little too rough. But this is an important time uh, during, during a child's life where they learn social rules and social boundaries and the important boundary between playing and aggression, right? So these are very important things that are expressed in, in multiple different species. Now, as the individual ages and moves into the adolescent period, these social interactions, you know, you exhibit, they tend to exhibit a lot less rough and tumble play, and they t tend to transform into, into, uh, into romantic or pre-romantic relationships, right? And there's tons of research on that as well. And then as adults, these relationships ultimately transform into durable social bonds. And what I think is really interesting about the, about the social bonds that between adults, these are things like marriages and long-term commitments that people make to each other, is that two things have to happen in a, in a, in a monogamous relationship. Whether you believe in monogamy or not is, is, is irrelevant, but if you, you know, we know that it exists. But in order for, mon for monogamy to occur, two things have to happen. One is that you have to form a tight social bond with somebody else whom you love, cherish, and want to spend your life with, right? The second thing is that as other potential mates come along, you have to reject them as possible, right? I mean, <laughs> some of us are better at this than others. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that this whole concept of pair bonding and the social rejection of, of other would-be mates, if you will, 
has even been shown in rodent species. And we know the brain circuits that control uh, social bonding and the brain circuits that control the rejection of other mates after the pair bond has been formed. Very cool research that's being done out there. And if we can do that in rodent species, we can do it in humans. So very interesting issues when it comes to uh, social relationships. Help. Something. There we go. OK. So how do we express this? We look at the different, when we look at the different social partners that exist across the lifespan, you know, if we start really at birth, the dominant, what, what I want to highlight here is take a moment, take a moment to highlight is, is the dominant uh, social partner or social group across the lifespan. So in infancy and early childhood, parents, siblings, and extended family are typically the predominant uh, social influence, whereas as the child uh, grows and develops, uh, perhaps extended family plays a little bit more, uh, more of a role. Caregivers come into play, primary caregivers, uh, which may be either daycare, nurse, nursery school, uh, teachers. But as the child ages, peers and friends become a more dominant influence and a primary form of social interaction relative to the parents. In fact, it's somewhat disturbing, if, for those of you who have children, to realize that you are losing your influence on your children because they're friends uh, at school are having a much greater influence. I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, and then eventually, you know, the peers and friends, will, of course, uh, continue to have a role. Then there's the dating and mating, and that's where it transforms in adolescence to, and young adulthood. And then ultimately, marriage and having kids of the, themselves, and uh, even during senescence, which is really, or, or natural aging, which is where we're working now, uh, you have valued partners and family. That doesn't mean that as, uh, as, you know, as you become married that your parents no longer have any influence because we know that that's not true. Uh, but, uh, but the relative role of each of these social groups transforms across, uh, across the lifespan. And so the question then is where, do, where does the teacher-child relationship come in? And that, I think, is probably during this early childhood to adolescent period where the teachers really play this unique social role in the life of a child that where you're in some ways acting uh, and bonded much like an extended family member. You're considered to be a caregiver because you have to help these kids through their daily lives. And you're also a peer and a friend, right? So the role that the teacher plays in a child, in, in, as, in, a, in the social world of a, of a developing child is very unique relative to all of the other, other groups. And so, the interesting thing here, another interesting thing, is that the cortex, right, these higher cognitive structures that we, that we talked about, uh, are, play a very different role in, 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 in learning than these other brain circuits that we call subcortical, these lower brain structures. If you go really low in the brain stem, right, these br brain structures tend to uh, do coordinate things like heart rate and breathing, very vital centers of the brain, right? And so as you move sort of intermediate way uh, up into these other areas of the brain in still subcortical regions, we have what we call fundamental motivational circuits. And what we know about social relationships and social interaction in other animals is that the cortex is not necessary at all for the progression of social behavior across the lifespan. This is a fundamental motivational circuit that requires expression in mammalian species, okay? So the need to interact deeply with other peers and other individuals is hardwired in our brains and expressed across multiple species. And so what are the different, are there, uh, another interesting question, and this is where uh, we'll be asking uh, some test questions at the end about the, your knowledge of the organization of social behavior. But uh, we have these <laughs> unique structures in the brain, and you know, as scientists, here's what we like to do. Uh, you know how you get these um, you know, little slotted trays where you would, might organize your fishing tackle, right? Where you've got a lure, each, each lure has its own little uh, you know, compartment. Or, or you've got buttons or beads that you're separating, and you've got different colors in each one. We've got them all neatly organized, and you know what each one of them do. They all kind of work the same, but maybe they look a little differently or have a slightly different function. This is what neuroscience has been doing for decades. We've been sorting through the brain 
breaking it down into smaller and smaller compartments and trying to identify what each, what each, of, each of those structures are doing. And now, we're not doing that anymore in neuroscience. You know what we're doing? We're taking those, those bins and connecting them together into distributed networks of activity and thinking about the cooperative interaction among different brain circuits. So I'm gonna talk about three different brain circuits today that are essential for social behavior. One of them is the hypothalamus. Now, this is where I always feel like I have to apologize for lying to you because uh, even though I will describe the hypothalamus as a single structure in your brain, we know that there are at least 28 separate functional units of the hypothalamus. And, you know, I think that's probably a little more depth than we need here. So it, we know a lot about this. But for specific types of uh, social behavior, what we know is that one division of the hypothalamus is critical for things like maternal care. It's highly active. In, you know, in the newborn mother. It is, um, if you have problems in that particular structure, or if you damage that structure in, in uh, preclinical models, then the maternal care drops off. And this is also one of the main sites where oxytocin is produced, which perhaps you've heard something about. The ventral medial nucleus, on the other hand, is involved in sexual behavior. If you were to take, uh, take males or females and do lesions of the ventral medial nucleus, then you can completely block, block uh, sexual behavior. So these are just two different forms of social interaction that are coordinated within this network of cells within the hypothalamus. That, of course, is very different than the, this other circuit that is involved in another par part of social behavior. And I think this is so exciting. It makes me want to dance. But uh, the point here is that this other system of neurons called the mesolimbic... You don't want me to dance, believe me. <laughs> The mesolimbic dopamine system is involved in, in, this, uh, in, in what I described earlier as pair bonding in, in animals, and it contributes to the rewarding aspects of social interactions. So dopamine release in this particular brain structure occurs in response to social interaction, and it makes you feel good. In fact, this is the same circuit that is activated when you snort cocaine or take other drugs of abuse. And so, Things like social interaction, sexual behavior, chocolate milk, and all other forms of chocolate, that's actually true, <laughs> uh, they activate this reward circuit in the brain, and they help contribute to the experience of pleasure and reward, okay? And so to see these key brain structures highly activated in response to, uh, in response to social interaction underscores the importance of that, 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 uh, that system, of course. Cocaine um, activates the system, you know, orders of magnitude more than social interaction. Okay, and then of course there's a third circuit, which uh, you know involves this complicated structure called the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis and the medial amygdala, and it, you can see the sort of network that's emerging here. This is a really interesting circuit that has been described as the mammalian social behavior network, and one of the key transmitters here that I'll talk about in a moment is vasopressin. Okay. And what's really interesting about vasopressin is that vasopressin and its natural variation in individuals can help tip the balances between normal social behavior and social aggression or social anxiety. And so the titration of these hormones and these, these molecules in brain are really critical. So this slide here just sort of summarizes all of that, and I don't really expect you to read that, but we thought that in the PDFs that you'll get and have access to that you might want to have uh, sort of deliberate summary of at least three key circuits that are regulate, known to regulate various forms of social interaction, okay? So uh, I've made reference to a couple of different molecules, and these are, these are probably three of the big ones. I don't want to assert that they are uh, the only ones that are involved in the regulation of social behavior. Uh, oxytocin in particular is particularly exciting. You, um, anybody had a baby out there? I've had three. I mean, wait, I didn't give birth to them, but oxytocin, anybody have to have, anybody have to be induced for labor? Okay. You took a drug probably called Pitocin, which is a synthetic drug that does the same thing as oxytocin. And so one of the things that oxytocin does when it's relieved in your released in your body is it stimulates uterine contractions, which is why it's a great tool for inducing labor. It's also released during things like lactation, helps stimulate milk letdown, 
and it's probably playing a secondary role in the formation of that social bond that seems to happen so immediately after birth between the mother and the infant, okay? So oxytocin levels are surging during that time. It turns out that oxytocin continues to be bioactive throughout the lifespan and is involved with many different aspects of social relationships. When administered to humans, it uh, seems to promote sense of well-being, a sense of trust. Um, some people describe this as the love hormone, and it's gotten a lot of, uh, you know, attention for that. That's probably, I'm a very conservative scientist in my interpretation, so it, that can get a little bit crazy for me. Vasopressin, as I al already mentioned, is, uh, is another very closely related protein. In fact, these things are so structurally similar that it's actually discriminate, difficult to discriminate between them. And in fact, birds, which are of course not mammals, have a peptide. They don't have oxytocin or vasopressin. They have a single molecule. Anybody know what it's called? This is very clever. Vasotocin. Okay, so it's actually an integrated molecule that evolutionarily predates either of these. So these hormones, or these peptides, um, evolved uh, in mammals after vasotocin. Very interesting, but vasopressin is critical for the normal expression of social behavior, and dopamine, of course, plays a role in the rewarding aspects of social behavior. Okay, so across development, what's really happening in brain function? We talked about two different uh, two different uh, sort of sets of, uh, of uh, brain structures. You have these uh, subcortical fundamental motivational circuits that are really very active and very mature at the time of birth. But what I told you is that the higher cognitive structures seem to have to, seem to require substantial amounts of postnatal life in order to develop. And so what happens is that you get this yin-yang effect where these higher cognitive structures over time gain greater and greater control over those subcortical motivational circuits. And so the baby that screams and cries and can't control itself when it's hungry or wants to nurse, you know, compared to a 20-year-old who has those same needs for nutrition, uh, is able to suppress, the 20-year-old is able to suppress those motivational urges, uh, whereas the, uh, the, the newborn is not. And so over time, you get greater and greater cognitive regulation of these fundamental motivational circuits, which is an interesting way to think about it. And even as adults, there continues to be a vacillation between higher cortical control and the regulation of these subcortically mediated motivation and impulsivity circuits, okay? Does that make sense? And so what we strive to do is engage greater and greater cognitive control over those things uh, as, the ch as the child develops, okay? That requires practice uh, and uh, very targeted activities. Okay, so when it comes to the formation of the social bond between the teacher and the child, there are lots of things that can modify this, right? We know that social behavior is very sensitive. Social interaction is very sensitive to lots of different things. We know that tenu tenuous social interactions and highly critical environments are profoundly distressing. So social experience can be, in particular in humans, can be very distressing. In fact, one of the other thing areas where we work is in the neurobiology of stress. Do you know what the best stress test is in humans? It's called the Trier social stress test. And do you know what this test involves? This test involves asking an adult to stand up in front of a group and give an impromptu presentation. <laughs> the second part of it is to ask them to do math, to solve simple math problems in front of a group. <laughs> and the activation of stress hormone release by these two procedures in adults is so profound that it is the standard, it's the gold standard for laboratory stress models. I have the sense from what my uh, six, eight, and 10-year-olds have told me that there's a certain amount of public reading that occurs in early childhood education. So my question is, how do we create an environment and how, you know, that is optimal where we can minimize the social stress and improve not just performance, but cognitive function, okay? So this is where the culture of the classroom and the nature of the relationships between that child and its peers between that child and you needs to be really delicately balanced.
okay? We also know that stressful circumstances, and I'm gonna focus a little bit on stress here for a moment, tends to narrow attention and focus. It creates what we call tunnel vision, right? Uh, and this is true uh, in both the physical sense of how your visual system is affected during stressful conditions, um, as well as in the metaphorical sense uh, in an academic environment. It also tends to limit creativity and su suppress exploration. And we have seen these things in non-human primates, not just in people. And ultimately, at the neural level, I already told you that it dampens neurogenesis and, and impairs learning, right? So we have a real need to minimize the stress in the classroom. Uh, what I will add to that is that there are a number of studies that have looked at the stress response in, during the transition uh, to a daycare environment or into the public schools. And uh, what they find is that there is pretty prof profound activation of stress responsive systems in kids in the first few days and the first couple of weeks of this, but they readily adapt, okay? So again, the infant, the child is highly plastic. They're very adaptable little organisms, um, but they do so in very different ways. Usually that's through the, the development of coping responses and a supportive social environment can improve that as well. Uh, and I give you one, just, just one example here about females, uh, their typical, typical coping response to stress uh, is, and is uh, that they tend to seek social support and interaction. They tend to talk things through, not in a way that they want the problem solved, but because they need to vent and they're looking for affirmation from their peers and their colleagues, right? <laughs> this is a known sex difference in psychology. Males, on the other hand, tend to take a problem-solving approach. And I'm telling you, even as a practicing psychologist, I have this conversation with my wife almost every night where she comes home, she vents to me about things that happened at work, and I supply her with solutions to the problem, which is exactly what she's not looking for. Okay. So the reality is that if we understand and appreciate some of these inherent individual differences, and these are just you know, differences based on sort of natural tendencies in, in boys versus girls, then we can, if we understand those on the individual level and what the individual needs, uh, then, uh, then we can uh, make much better progress in helping the individual child to learn. Because yes, we want our average test scores to improve in our children, but we want each and every kid to contribute to that increase, right? Not always possible, but there's gotta be a big goal. Okay, so again, just a review of the, some of these uh, com concepts that we want to consider uh, about the relationship between uh, a well-bonded, uh, positive cultural, you know, local culture and social environment of the classroom and how that can impact the perceived state of stress in individuals and how that uh, ultimately impacts uh, the learning environment. Sorry. Okay, so this is where I'm supposed to pass the baton onto the other Dr. Deke. Thanks. Yeah. So the computer isn't working? <laughs> the computer isn't working up here, so it just has a really picture of stars on it, so I guess I have to look back there. Okay, take a breath. Wiggle your toes, wiggle your butt, and everybody put your hands above your head a few times. Great. What that does is start the blood flow back up to your brain, um, because I think Terry took it all. <laughs> 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 oh, Lord, I love this boy. <sighs> but I'm so simple compared to him. I love to hear him talk. Here, let me put in a nutshell what he said to you. Your feelings and your connections with others as you are growing will enhance the growth of your brain or de-enhance the growth of your brain. That's what he just told you in 45 <laughs> minutes. But you need to hear this. You are the central person during most of the day in these children's lives during peak brain growth. And we're trying to give you the science to tell the world that early childhood educators 
hold the brains of every kid in their hand. And the foundation for all brain growth and later use is happening while it's in your hands. And I'm going to distill this way down and say this to you. Here's the first thing. I like the fact that you understand child development, that you've taken courses, that you understand how to have them do spatial tasks and a variety of other things that you've learned wherever you've been to school. But if the most important thing that you do every day is to hit what Terry calls the subcortical structures, which is to get them to believe that you care about them. We have sturdy research, as he showed. If a child believes you care about him or her, she will learn better and he will grow better. And if they believe you don't care about them, the obverse is true. But did you hear the word believe? That's the problem. Because their executive function their prefrontal cortex that helps in judgment is not fully grown. And it may be that you care about them, but they don't believe it. And your job every day is to make every child believe down to their toes that you care about them. I did not say you like them. <laughs> Some kids are hard to like but that you care about them. And you have to work harder with those kids that push your buttons to not let that show. Do you know what I'm saying to you? Some kids, it's just so easy to let them know you care about them. Others, it's darn hard work. And I would say from my experience, those kids who it's darn hard work need it the most, need it to mo the most to change them. So that's the first thing I would say to you. And I'm going to repeat it because it's so important. I'm very premeditated in my words with children. I'm very careful in what I say. We're stunned by how one word can throw a child. Anything that smacks of a put down or a question about their integrity or their capability, or anything. And the word reaffirm is highlighted because weird things happen to kids, and they start to think that maybe you don't care about them. So every time when they come into your room, you should act like you are so <laughs> thrilled that they're there. You're here again today. I can't wait to spend the day with you. When this is the kid that kicked you and bit you yesterday, you see? <laughs> and they should walk in like this, waiting for you to say how, how much you want to be with them that day. And so do those repeat things. And it never gets old with kids. I know we get busy, and I see teachers go and getting things ready for the kids. Please don't do that. Please don't do that when they're coming in. They're coming in giving your, themselves to you. Every morning, they're bringing you this present called themselves, and they expect you to act like it's a present. So reaffirm it every day. And the final part of this you need to remind them periodically that it's a step beyond this one, especially after you've had to set some boundaries. Terry, I really don't like when you use your teeth to remove parts of skin of other kids. <laughs> <laughs> OK. And can we have a pinky promise that that won't happen again? Absolutely. OK. What a good, oh, you're just. <laughs> now. Sometimes I have to do that with less joy in my voice because we have to do what we call stoppage, okay? He's about to take the fork that he's eating his fruit with and stick it in the eye of somebody. Probably my voice is not going to come out, Terry, honey, 
<laughs> and, he, and he is going to hear the clarity with which I am stopping him or the clarity with which I am saying to him, we really don't do this here. We, I really don't want you to do that. I'm not going to say that with joy in my voice, nor should I. Kids need to learn that adults get pushed, that there are lines that we have that if you go over, we're not going to smile at you. And so when we do something like that, many kids, I've interviewed hundreds, think afterwards, now I've done it, they, this teacher really hates me. And so never let kids go home at the end of the day after some kind of disciplinary or stoppage kind of thing without undoing that. Can't wait to see you tomorrow. I don't really mean that. I'm hoping maybe he'll stay home tomorrow and I'll have an easier day, you know. But why? The subcortical structures that cause me to care almost like breathing, how you connect to me will help my brain to keep growing. I must have that. Please hear what we're saying. It isn't just nice. It is requirement to keep this brain growing. I owe him that, even though he's driving me absolutely not so crazy. Okay? Isn't this fun? I don't have much more. And it's good because we're running out of time. You know this stuff. Talking at the 92nd Street Y is always fun for me because I always feel like I'm preaching to the choir. You know this stuff. How do you let someone know that you care about them? Okay, I'm tired of talking. Let's do a little audience participation. I'm gonna point to you, get ready. I want you to give me one way that you could let me know that you care about me. And if you're sitting in the back and you think you got away with it, I can see you. <laughs> Turquoise. Yep. Absolutely. She says give a hug. Somebody else. Smile. Smile. Somebody else. <laughs> Whistle. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's Lydia back there, isn't it? Uh huh. If you get a chance to hear Lydia talk about language, she's quite something. I quote you all over the world. I have to tell you, Lydia is one of the language development gurus that I trust in the world. And she does this imitation of her adolescent talking on the phone. Can I do it? I just love it. She talks about how language changes over time. And this is her adolescent son talking on the phone. Yo, I eat. <laughs> down. Later. <laughs> and that's it. That's it after a half an hour. And, it, and you know what it means. Hey, I'm really glad that you called. I, I like talking to you. I agree with everything you say. Yeah, I can do that too. And you bet I'll meet you there. That's what those four <laughs> words meant. <laughs> Didn't I do good? Okay. So, so you know these that I'm going to put up here. Okay. I have, some, I have a but to these. And you've probably noticed it might be a big one. The but to that, don't you laugh. <laughs> the but to these are this. We have more and more kids who don't fit what I call the run of the mill. We have kids who are on the spectrum. We have kids who have been abused. We have kids who culturally, when you look them in the eye, that is not a good feeling. And so you have to be careful that those things you yelled out, like smile, some kids who haven't had the experience early on can actually feel that a smile is more like a grimace. By the way, don't ever smile at a strange dog. No, I mean that. Because showing teeth is a sign of aggression for dogs. So don't smile at dogs. You're usually in pretty good shape if you smile at children. But even these kinds of things. Always check with parents if you can. If you can't, you know this. As, and touch is incredibly important. We're finding that touch activates so many things. It's so critical for most human interaction that I want you to touch kids. 
as much as you can in appropriate places. <laughs> and I let parents know I'm a touchy person. I'll touch your, your child's shoulder or their arm, and I'll even rub his head because he, no, I won't do that. Try not, to, try to be careful with heads because with some cultures and religions, heads are holy and you don't touch them. So I, I don't touch heads unless I ask permission, even with little kids. So I do shoulders or arms, that kind of thing. And when they come in, in general, I want you to touch them. I want you to shake their hands or do French fries. That's the new way of greeting. Can you do French fries with me? Do you know French fries? I do not. He is just not with it, this boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with your shaking hand, you do French fries. Don't touch me, but just a little bend in them. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's French fries. I know elbow kisses. What's up? Gotcha. Boom. Oh, I love this. That's what we do when we're sick at our house. All right. Elbow, Elbow kisses. kisses, french fries. And you can have the kids make up their greeting, OK? And if they don't want to be touched, the french fries don't touch, OK? And if I wouldn't do elbow kisses, obviously, but it's better than shaking hands. So, so watch these natural cues that you have and make sure that each is appropriate. Here's the kicker. If a child believes you care about him or her, even the kids that have trouble with eye contact or touch will handle it decently well. But if they believe you don't care about them or they're afraid of you in any way, any little thing will set them off. And even things like proximity will make them more stressed than not. OK? Do you have any questions about these? Can you add anything to it up here about showing a human being, a small human being, that you care about him or her that you would like to see on this? OK, absolutely. And I will put that on for the next group. Saying a person's name is really something special. And it's always good in the first few weeks of school if you could learn the story behind their name. And some kids know the story behind their name, and some don't. And if they don't know it, have them go home. And that's their homework, to ask how I got this name and come in and tell. The example I like to give is mine. When I was four, I told my mother she was mean and ugly for naming me Joanne. <laughs> because my uncle and Joe are two of the most despicable human beings I know. And I thought I was named after them. And I thought, how could she call me Joanne? They're just really awful people. And so I wanted to change my name to Sonny. <laughs> and she said, oh, honey, you're named after your grandparents, John and Anne. And we kind of smooshed it together. I never met John and Anne. They died before I was born. But everybody I talked to said that, said that they were the best human beings in the world. And now I was named after the best human beings in the world. And so you can call me Joanne, not Sonny, OK? <laughs> so. A person's name is a treasured thing and try to make a big deal out of it and use it. Some human beings get away with this. One of the best early childhood teachers I've ever worked with in my life would make up nicknames for every kid. She worked with three, four, and five-year-olds. You know, And whether my name would have been Joey or if she had heard my story called me Sunny kind of thing. To a person she taught for 50 years, to a person, every one of, their, of her graduates came back to the school, and when they introduced themselves, used the name that she had given them. So there's something very special about names, and so know that and, and deal with it. Is there anything else anybody else would put? Yes? Absolutely. And the corollary to that, tell them something about you. I tell, yeah. Yeah. I tell kids about my name, Joanne, and why I like it so much. And they never forget that. So it's a two way street. But don't take over and start telling them all your life stories kind of thing. <laughs> Does anybody have anything else? Yes. That's you, yeah. I didn't hear it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> what? What? 
And if you have a problem hearing, you better deal with it. <laughs> what else? Hmm. Hmm. She says singing. May I recommend a video to you on TED.com? Yeah, you go on TED.com and put in Patricia Kuhl, K-U-H-L, and it's about language acquisition, but one of the parts of it, she does two video clips of an English-speaking woman and a Japanese-speaking woman speaking what she calls mother ease to babies. And even the Japanese person, if you don't understand Japanese, you can pretty much tell what she's saying. And it is that kind of sing-song, kind of light voice that babies especially respond to. But may I say also use clear words when you do that too, and not just goo at them. But there is something about music we find up and down the phylogenetic scale that it gets to those subcortical re regions that Terry is talking about for most, most people. Be careful, though, with music that is recorded because if there's a bad association with it, if something happened when some music was playing, playing that music is, is not going to be positive for the child. So you have to be very careful. You're usually safe with something you sing or lullabies or anything. There's probably more, but I'd like you to be able to ask Terry questions too, so I want to make sure that I say the danger part. I just like to share with him. When I pause, I'm assuming you're reading this. If you ever say these phrases and I'm around, and I've said them hundreds of times, but after today you won't say them, because even light sarcasm or any kind of contempt, my research and others show it begins immediately to erode relationship, and that can last forever. Zero sarcasm with young children. Even watch your teasing. Teasing is an adult phenomenon that is understood by a pretty large prefrontal cortex. Teasing, sarcasm, contempt, zero until a little bit later. Hear me, erodes relationship in the short run or possibly forever. These are deadly. Second danger area, guilt and shame. I was raised as a Catholic. I'm still getting over some of that. <laughs> Guilt and shame are critical emotions for homo sapiens to have. They keep us from doing things like killing others when they aggravate us, stealing things that aren't ours. But when you use it as a weapon, as a way of controlling behavior of young children, it begins to erode their self-esteem. So use your disciplinary techniques and your stoppage techniques without guilt or shame. This is very important research. These need to now be removed from your repertoire in dealing with young children. Yes? That's not a problem. I mean, All you're doing is, like no, but you're being descriptive. Right. Yeah, you're being descriptive. That, I don't, fall, I don't put that in that category, okay? And let me just remind you, we're gonna ask for any questions and ideas or concerns, and then I'm gonna put up again where you can get, that's Terry with his sons, isn't that neat? I didn't have any of my, any children to put up, so that's me and Sandra Bullock. Um, <laughs> my new best friend, she, 
Her son, Louis, was working at a preschool, or was working at a preschool, attending a preschool that I was working at in New Orleans uh, about a month ago, and um, she came walking in, and I just couldn't resist, so. What do you want to know? Ask any question you want. Yes? Do you want to say anything? Sure. I mean, uh, my, my comment is, would be that rough and tumble play is probably a time and a place for it. And the better place to do that is to let them exercise those rough and tumble play muscles at home or at a place where there's, you know, not desks everywhere and chairs. It's going to bleed into the... Uh, is that a pun? Yeah, no. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to come into the classroom once in a while also. And when it comes into the classroom, I think part of my reflection here is that we can't be overly critical of something that is hardwired in our brains, right? And that it's going to happen. So try and move, move beyond it and, uh, and get it to happen in a more gentle way. But don't be over, overly critical of the child for feeling compelled to engage in that kind of behavior. We so, can't, we sh and to be clear, we should not be telling them that it's wrong but that this is not the time or place for it. And some preschools talk with their kids about play fighting in a gentle kind of way, and that they have to be very careful about not hurting others, and then they give it a try, and then, again, it's a learning kind of thing. Um, so whether your school can handle it or not, but how you talk about it with parents and, and, and what you say to the child is important. But, but Terry's point and, and mine with the brain research is, this is hardwired in as a way of exploring relationships with others, finding boundaries, and in, in general, engaging a variety of growth potential of the, of the brain. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, look, we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say something about it, and, and Terry can. Um, everybody comes into every place with their baggage. And the younger you are, the heavier that baggage can feel. On the other hand, the reason we're spending so much time talking to you about how critical your role is in connecting with a child. Most kids have enough resilience that when they come into your classroom and it feels like their sanctuary, that it is unlike their home life, that you are unlike some adult at home that is causing them real distress. There is the ability to temporarily set that aside. And that, that's your job. Your job is to create an incredible sanctuary where that when these kids come in, they almost, almost forget what's over there. And that's the best we have to offer. And then those kids who have an insidious impact into their core self, you really need to have them working with somebody in addition to you. You must. It has to be a bifurcated approach that while you're with me, I'm yours, you're mine, we're here, it's okay, but I also want you work with, working with somebody on the side to help dredge out that and, and try to do some repair work. It's a combo. 
Did you have anything I, to add I, to that? I would just I would just add that you know when kids come in and they don't they don't have a lot of experience with positive and appropriate social behavior, the two best things that you can do is model positive positive social interactions and facilitate their interaction and effect and, and appropriate social behavior with the kids for the age that you're working with. And, you, and early childhood. Facilitated play. Yeah. And such. You early childhood people mediate incredibly well. Now, use your words, tell him, you know, and you do that so well that you give them the, 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 the tools and the words to do that. You notice how him keeps coming out of my mouth. See this woman walking down here? She's in charge of everything in this room. And she also signs the check that the two of us get. So we are now going to say goodbye to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir.